Welcome everyone, Kostin here on Sirius Gaming with the discussion about the current chaos in Moldova. What's going on, who's to blame, what led to the, these events and who is fighting for political dominance in the country. Why are there tens of thousands of people in one of the poorest countries in Europe out on the streets? A country with a GDP of about 18 billion dollars. A population of 3.5 million people, excluding Transnistria, which is a breakaway region like Abkhazia or South Ossetia or the Donbass in Ukraine, breakaway region with about 500,000 people. Well, history of Moldova, modern day Moldova, is a bit complicated and I just want to gloss over it so you have some understanding of how things uh, are right now, because that's actually necessary to, under to have an understanding of why things are as they are at the moment. So modern-day Moldova is known in Romania as the historic region of Basarabia. It's it was part of Moldova for a very long uh, for a uh, well, part of the principality of Moldova for a very long period of time until the Russians took it. They took the entirety of Basarabia, which basically split the historical uh, portion uh, historical Moldova. It split that in two. It wasn't necessarily the most important part. But yeah, it took away a very large chunk of Moldova and they tried to colonize it, they tried to culturally assimilate it, they tried to destroy the language, they tried the culture, the customs of the people there. They failed even though there was a ban on the Romanian language, Moldova do speak Romanian. Even though they would call it Moldovian, it's really Romanian, it's the same language. I was just re watching today the Moldovan Prime Minister talking um, in quote-unquote Moldovan and yeah it's Romanian basically it's an accent but still it's very much Romanian it's perfectly understandable by anyone living in Romania so anyway point is that the Russians failed to fully integrate the, this region and because of that there was political fighting with uh, Romania once the kingdom of Romania was born and following the collapse of Russia in the aftermath of the First World War, the collapse of the Russian Empire, Romania gained, regained control of Basarabia, added, to the, added it to the Greater Kingdom of Romania. It should be pointed out that it was Mold local Moldovan authorities or politicians, whatever, following the collapse of the Russian Empire, following the victory of the German Empire in World War I against the Russians, before they got defeated in the West, uh, it was... Um, the local Moldovan authorities who voted to actually join the Greater Kingdom of Romania, so they did, and Greater Romania was born in 1980. 18, my bad. Anyway, so for a couple of years, about what, two, just a bit over two decades, Basarabia became part of Romania again, you know, as it had been historically part of uh, Moldova. So he rejoined the motherland as it were. Then World War II happened and Stalin forced Romania to give up Basarabia and Northern, Northern Bukovina, which historically I guess you would argue is part of Transylvania. At any rate, uh, we had to cede territory to the Soviet Union following the start of World War II. And point of fact, this is one of the main reasons Romania actually joined the Axis in World War II. Also because there was no fucking choice and between the Germans and the Russians, Romania and the preference for the Germans. Though it should be pointed out that the mentality of the, the Kingdom of Romania during World War II, as per General Manstein, Manstein, who put it very well, is that Romanians wanted the Germans to defeat the Russians, then for the Allies, the British, Canadians, Australians, all that, French, Free French, to defeat the Germans. As had happened in World War I, basically. They wanted a repeat of the World War I situation because that had been very beneficial. Romania was not quite in favor of German uh, homogeny over Europe for a bloody good reasons. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, so the Axis obviously lost World War II and Romania lost for good Basarabia during the, during the Cold War. And there were quite a few other concessions as well. During the Cold War, Moldova was organized as the Moldovan SSR, but it lost the southern half called the Romanian Buchag, you know, you might know it as Bajuk. It's southwestern Ukraine, just west of Odessa, basically. Um, where there's actually a lot of Bulgarians for some reason, anyway, <laughs> I don't know quite uh, 
exactly why, but there's a lot of minorities living there, including a decent number of Romanians, Bulgarians, etc. Uh, Nikita Khrushchev put that as part of Ukraine. Then during the Cold War, Moldova also gained Transnistria. Very small strip of land that used to be part of the Ukrainian SSR. That was given basically to the Moldovan SSR to manage. And Nikita Khrushchev, I might add, also was the guy who made Crimea part of the Ukrainian SSR instead of the Russian SSR. Which obviously wouldn't have no negative impact decades down the line after the Cold War ended, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you can thank that bloody Id idiot for creating many of the frozen conflicts that exist right now. And also really the Soviet political elite and the KGB and GRU, military intelligence, uh, most people don't know what the KGB is. Not that many know what about the GRU. Anyway, foreign intelligence, military intelligence, etc. Um, <clears throat> the intent there was to split these various SSRs in such a way that there would be conflicts on ethnic language, you know, cultural um, on cu cultural lines when uh, if if something happened to the Soviet Union. That's what happened in South Ossetia and Abkhazia and Georgia. Uh, that's what happened in Transnistria. That's what happened in Crimea, etc., etc. That's kind of how the whole thing was split. It's also a problem in Estonia because there's a good number of Russians uh, living in Estonia, for instance, which aren't treated that well. And then the 90s came. Soviet Union collapsed and Transnistria wanted to break away from the Moldova and SSR after Moldova declared its independence. There were a couple of reasons for this. One, that Transnistrians didn't want Moldova to reunify. They didn't want to be part of Romania. They wanted... Uh, many of them are Russian speakers or Russians. And they, they wanted certain rights, which the central Moldovan government was not willing to give. And they yeah, they didn't want to be a part of the Kingdom of Romania. The poor the poor treatment they received from the government in Chisinau led to a war between Moldova and Transnistria. Moldova was supported only by volunteers from Romania, no one else. Whereas Transnistria was supported by the 14th Guards uh, Army, which was stationed in, its, in Transnistria and uh, Ukraine and Russia. If there's one reason why I don't look favorably on Ukraine, it's because it's not that fucking different than Russia. It's just a smaller version of Russia. And in some ways, it's actually far worse than Russia. But hey, what the fuck do I know, right? Anyway, <clears throat> on that subject. So the war happened. And that war, most importantly, the Moldovan loss killed any hope of reunification in the short term with Romania. Because it created a frozen conflict, it created a political nightmare. Romania will never accept reunification with Moldova because it doesn't want to deal with Transnistria. Where in Transnistria right now, sure, Ukraine may have dropped its support for Transnistria after a couple of years or, you know, after the 2000s. But uh, there's still Russian troops, about a thousand Russian troops still stationed in Transnistria. Of course, there's a question to be asked about Transnistria as to what would happen with Transnistria in the longer term because it's not viable on its own. It relies on Russian's, uh, Russian aid to survive, to function. It's isolated uh, geographically, so joining Russia is out of the question. It's not as important as a Kaliningrad for Russia to accept that and have to deal with the logistical nightmares of applying it like they do with uh, Kaliningrad. And obviously, Russian... Uh, uh, and Ukrainian relations are not really good right now, nor are Russian and Romanian relations. Uh, relations. Uh, by the way, Romania and Poland, for instance, will love nothing more than for both Ukraine and Russia to collapse as countries. That's what the political elite in both the, our countries would want to happen. Anyway, <clears throat> so that war killed any chance of short-term reunification. And because... Moldova had been part of the Soviet Union in itself and because the Soviet Union had been very corrupt and because any chance of joining a somewhat better country in a sense uh, were killed and because of the political instability and chaos of the 90s in particular in former Soviet uh, Union states and the way the Soviet Union had been created and organized that led to a very high degree of corruption and it was very difficult for Moldova to actually gain good relations with the West. 
in part because there's a very large portion of the population that's pro-Western, there's a large portion of the population that's pro-Russian, and also is divided on political lines. On top of that, as with every single Eastern European country, you had businessmen, oligarchs, gaining a great deal of political power and prominence. In Moldova, there's two guys, both of them, funnily enough, named Vladimir. They're fierce rivals, but yeah, two Vladimirs took control of uh, large portions of Moldova. And when I say large portions of Moldova, I mean Moldovan state institutions, including the prosecutor's office, which is actually quite important later on uh, to this whole story that I'm giving here. <laughs> it's kind of sad, really. Anyway, so you have a country divided between pro-Westerns, pro-Westerners, pro pro-Russians, then the oligarchs, and then there's the people who are pro-reunification. These can fall, you know, under the camp of pro-Western, but not necessarily. You know, not, you, you don't, not all people who are pro-Western in the country are pro-reunification. In fact, there's not that many people in Moldova who are actually pro-reunification. There's a large number of people in Romania who are pro-reunification, but not that many in Moldova. I think the the um, polls taken before May 2015 showed about 20% of the population was in favor of unification with Romania. So that's us, uh, people living in Moldova. In Romania, it was, what, over 60-70%, I believe? Anyway, very high number in comparison to Moldova. So a lot of people in Romania want to see Moldova rejoin the motherland, as it were. A lot of people in Moldova don't want that. And, you know, because the country is divided between pro-Westerners, pro-Russians and oligarchs, you get the same problems as, say, Ukraine, right? Yeah, you get Russia meddling in affairs, you get Romania meddling in Moldovan affairs, you get Europe uh, meddling in affairs, and that creates a lot of problems and creates a political divide. For many years in Moldova, uh, in early 2000s, there was... Uh, Especially in 2009, there was a political gridlock between the communists, yes, the communists, and everyone else in terms of political parties trying, uh, trying to get power. The communists didn't have a majority, but they had enough votes to prevent a president from being put in charge of the country. And there's been a lot of political fighting since then. Russia has also sanctioned Moldova after the they signed the European Association Agreement. They got some bonuses from that, but they also paid a certain price um, for that regards to Russia. And their economy has been hit quite hard by uh, the sanctions, the war in Ukraine, the instability of Ukraine, etc. And you know the situation in Europe as a whole. Moldova is in a pretty shitty state as is at the moment. And it's been in that state for a number of years. The political infighting is particularly bad. In 2015, things got really damned nasty. A billion dollars in a country with a GDP of 18 billion dollars was stolen. Officially it went missing, basically got stolen. And the main culprit, at least that's what the prosecution, which is controlled by one of the oligarchs, decided that Vladimir Filat, one of the two oligarchs with the most amount of power in the country, was responsible and they arrested him in October of 2015. But the prosecution is controlled by the other oligarch, a guy also named Vladimir. How awesome is that, right? Two Vladimirs fighting for political supremacy in Moldova. Each of them controls various portions of the country. So, yeah, nice divide there, right? You take the Minister of Interior, I take the prosecution, you take the army, so on and so forth. That's how things are in Moldova. It should be pointed out these oligarchs are not necessarily in favor of being pro-West or pro-Russian. It's the, it depends on what's better for them personally. They're very um, selfish like that. Same situation with people like Poroshenko or Yanukovych. Yanukovych was not Putin's puppet. He just made a deal with Russia because it was a better deal. Russia offered him three billion dollars. Europe offered him fuck all. So yeah, he was gonna take the three billion dollars. Poroshenko is not pro-Western, he just sees the West as a better deal, for now, though he was in Yanukovych's uh, party before. This is talking about Ukraine. Whereas the Ukrainian Prime Minister, Yatsyanyuk, is very much pro-Western, so you can see it's kind of similar to that in Moldova. Incidentally, uh, the government in 2015 was quite pro-Western, 
but it was taken down by various corruption scandals. All politicians in Eastern Europe are all deeply corrupt scumbags. All of them. There's no exception. Really, you're not the political leader in Eastern Europe if you're not the corrupt scumbag. Simple as that. That's just how it is. That's norm. People accept that. Welcome to Eastern Europe. This is how things are <laughs> here. But that government apparently was seen as very corrupt. There were protests against them. The collapse of the economy of Moldova didn't help things either. But after Vladimir Filat was arrested for supposedly stealing that $1 billion, their protests only got worse as his main uh, ri political rival, his fellow oligarch, also named Vladimir, took the chance to basically gain full, co uh, uh, full control of the country. And people are not so happy about that. And you've got the situation right now where you've got both pro-Russians and pro-Western people, along with people who are in favor of reunification, all fighting against this guy. <laughs> Basically, it's like they all turned against oligarchs. You look at Russia today, for instance, it's been reporting on the situation. You look at Western sources, they've also been reporting on this. Basically, both Russia and the West have thrown their lot in, in support against the oligarchs in Moldova. The problem? Things have gotten fairly fucking nasty. A few days ago, protesters stormed the parliament, and that's something that never happened even in Ukraine, at the height of the Maidan, when a hundred people got killed. That's something that didn't happen in Ukraine. Not in the war, not for all the instability, all the chaos. In fact, the people who were most closely associated with the protesters in Ukraine, or even the far-right groups, told, begged them not to storm the parliament, because that would cause the country to go into chaos. What did the protesters in Moldova do? They stormed the fucking parliament and beat up members, certain members of parliament. Certain people got injured, the police intervened finally. Even though they were initially overwhelmed, the police intervened, the gendarmes intervened and beat the crap out of the protesters, but the damage has been done. When a country has its parliament stormed like that, things are going to hell. Quickly. And Moldova, because of its poor economy, because of its political infighting, has no stability at the moment. Governments, a lot of governments have fallen over the last two years, a great deal of them. And many of the political elite are seen as untrustworthy by the people leading the protest movement and they want to get rid of all of them. They want to cleanse the political class. That means that Moldova is going to shit. The Maidan, I wouldn't necessarily consider the Euromaidan a revolution, but what's happening in Moldova right now might just be one. And that's, uh, and it, might, it won't be a peaceful, it won't be a bloodless one, I might add. The political elite will fight tooth and nail to, uh, to keep uh, themselves in power. So that's a problem at the moment in Moldova. And this creates a bigger problem, actually, than Moldova itself. You might think, well, that, what does this shitty small country with 3.5 million people matter in the large scheme of things? Well, besides the, conf the frozen conflict in Transnistria and R Russia being able to take advantage of that, or the West taking advantage of that and creating more instability, bigger problem. From Ukraine's border with Russia all the way to Greece and Turkey, this entire part of Eastern Europe is unstable as fuck. I'm talking here of Ukraine. I'm talking here of Hungary, which is ruled by Viktor Orban. Talking about Poland, although Poland, you know, obviously there's a bit of separation there. But Poland, Ukraine, Hungary, Bulgaria. Because Bulgaria has to deal with the refugee crisis and their government in itself is also not that stable. Moldova, Turkey, because of their their game with ISIS and the fact they have a civil war going on across the border and there's terrorist attacks in Turkey and then Greece because their economy has basically collapsed and they're on life support at the moment and they have to deal with a very large number of refugees moving through their borders to try and reach Western Europe. If you don't see the writing on the wall let me put it like this the only country in the at the moment in Eastern Europe that's stable of all, of all that are there is Romania. Romania stands between Ukraine and Bulgaria. Guess what? Romania might be stable at the moment, but we're not removed from that. We've managed to weather the refugee crisis because refugees don't go into Romania. We managed to avoid any instability due to the Ukrainian crisis because, well, we don't have that much in common with Ukrainians and all that. That's all well and good. At the same time, However, Moldova might just be the one thing that 
destabilizes Romania. And you might wonder why. Well, if there's blood in that's going to be spilled in Moldova, that's going to really affect Romania because there's free travel between Moldova and Romania. The Romanian government, in the hopes of winning the hearts and minds of the Moldovan people and, you know, helping their brothers, that's the mentality, uh, gave free travel permissions to the people in Moldova. You don't need a passport even, forget a visa. You just go with your ID card and you can cross the Romanian-Moldovan border. That's the problem. And that's gonna screw things, <laughs> screw things for Romania. And if Moldova falls in chaos, then Romania might fall in chaos, the, the whole thing might become unstable. And what I'm practically saying is that if things keep going the way they're going, I'm not saying that they're gonna happen like this, but th there's the potential, there's the risk of this happening, then the whole of the e of Eastern Europe might just collapse into chaos and infighting and what else happened in Chechnya, warlords. That's uh, particularly clear for Ukraine. Don't think Transnistria isn't looking at what's happening right now, for instance, in, uh, in Moldova. Don't think that Putin is uh, ignorant of that. Don't think the European Union is ignorant of that. Though Moldova has been ignored for a lo very long period of time in favor of the refugee crisis. Right now, Europe is not in a very, very good spot, and this is going to hurt us even further. The writing's on the wall. What's done about that? Well, you can only hope that the people who have the power to do s to change things, they will take a stand and they will fix things. If they instead decide to f uh, fight for political power in Moldova, then that's going to affect Romania. And if Romania also also uh, gets unstable, and which it might, you know, when you're surrounded by increasingly unstable countries or wannabe dictators like Viktor Orban, he basically is that he favors an illiberal democracy, whatever the fuck that means, um, then you have a real risk of becoming unstable yourself. Yeah, great, great. Hmm. So what's the solution, you might ask yourself. <laughs> There's no simple solution, to put it bluntly, this is what happens for after two, point, two decades and a half of incompetent, corrupt leadership in the countries of Eastern Europe, in particular Ukraine and Moldova. That's really it. And because of the political fighting between West and Russia. That's also one of the issues here. And you might think, oh, the US doesn't fight Russia over influence in Eastern Europe. Guess who fights Russia, actually, politically and economically in Eastern Europe? Poland and Romania do, for instance. The Baltics also do, because they have their own beef with Russia, right? And so them joining NATO just gave them a lot of power to do so, and they do want to fight Russia. Romania and Poland, well, nothing more than for Russia to collapse. The problem is that with everything that's going on, we might go first long before Russia goes. For all the problems Russia has, we're in a worse state than they are at the moment. The Moldovan crisis is nothing more than a symptom to a far larger problem. That the European Union is collapsing. Costine here on Serious Gaming, signing out. <laughs>